Befal studied history, American studies, Japanese studies in Berlin, in Tokyo, in uh, Graz, and also in Vienna. And uh, when I asked her, she said kind of everywhere. So it's her third talk uh, on the Chaos Communication Congress. She was here three years ago and two years ago, and we are very happy to have her back. Uh, please welcome her. Thank you. Oh, I'm on. That's good. Um, I would have taken that screwdriver, but okay, it's too bad. Um, well, thank you all for being here. I hope you're all having a good time so far. It's day three, and um, I'm having a good time. <laughs> it's a very good Congress. Um, this year, unfortunately, it's been hard for some people to actually be here. It's been a nightmare to buy tickets online. So, in addition, I'd like to welcome everybody watching the stream from at home or uh, Congress everywhere. So, thank you for watching. Um, Any one of you watching this from at home or any one of you who has some sort of cell phone, mobile device connected uh, to the Congress Wi-Fi has actually been using uh, spread spectrum technology in the past couple of days. Um, but this is not a talk about spread spectrum technology. Oh, and I wanted to give a hint to the translations team in German, that's Bandspreizverfahren. <laughs> And um, je suis désolé, je ne sais pas what it means in French. So this is not what I want to talk about because I would never pretend to be an electrical engineer or a fully trained computer scientist who is qualified to explain this very complex technology. Um, what I want to do is tell you a story, give you a short 20-minute overview of um, a person, a remarkable person, who um, worked on the development of spread spectrum technology about 75 years ago, and until recently uh, was not recognized for her accomplishments. Um, Let's say you are an electrical engineer or you are a computer scientist and you want to learn about this technology. I, I try to avoid saying it because it's such a tongue twister and I'm going to stumble over the spread spectrum. So, yeah. Um, so you go to your library and you find lots of big handbooks. Handbook on spread spectrum communication, for example. Um, and there usually you have sort of an introduction with um, something like this. Never mind if you can't read it right now, I've, I've uploaded my slides so you can look at it later and I'll, I'll also explain anything that's important. This is from an Austrian handbook. And of course it mentions uh, Claude Shannon in 1948 publishing a mathematical theory of communication a very important paper, and before that, actually, it mentions in 1942, Markey and Antile are patenting the first spread spectrum system ever. So, you're wondering, who is Markey and Antile? Probably some guys at MIT, right? Working for the military. Uh, in 1942, developing secret weapons. Could be. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is Markey. Hedwig Kiesler, born in 1914 in Vienna. She was a beautiful child. She was 16 when she decided to quit school and become an actress. She started hanging around the Sasha film studio in Vienna. Um, she also stalked famous director Max Reinhardt until he uh, cast her in his play The Weaker Sex. She had a couple more minor roles. She played Sissy. She played opposite Heinz Rühmann. And it was 
Oopsie. It was Max Reinhardt who, um, promoting his play, uh, coined the phrase, Hedy Kiesler is the most beautiful woman in the world. And the press picked it up very quickly. Here she is again. Then, when she was 18, she did something very daring. She starred in a Czech film called Ecstasy. It's very interesting. Please ask me about it or watch it on YouTube. Um, there was full frontal nudity. And she faked the first on-screen orgasm. The film was banned, the Pope denounced it, and Hedy became famous. <laughs> um, but then, after ecstasy, surprisingly, Hedy stopped acting, and she married this guy. She became uh, the young trophy wife of Fritz Mandel. He was, at that time, the third richest man in Austria. He was the owner of the Hiltenberger ammunition factory. He was also an Austro-fascist. He supplied weapons to a lot of unsavory individuals and uh, organizations. And um, as his beautiful young trophy wife, she was supposed to be there at parties, at meetings with important industrialists, uh, weapons dealers, politicians, and to just stand there and look beautiful. But she also listened when they uh, spoke about developments, about German um, glide bombs being uh, tested and developed. She listened and um, she noticed. After a couple of years, for whatever reason, I think Mandel was pretty controlling and then jealous. For one reason or another, Hedy left him and used her ecstasy fame um, to go to the US and get a contract at MGM in 1937. Um, her first film in the US was Algiers. Um, and this film established her fame, her new look, her hairstyle and um, this very distant kind of unsmiling style that MGM had in mind for her. And they also um, promoted her as the most beautiful woman in the world. Um, critics usually agreed that she could not act, but oh my God, she's so beautiful, who cares? <laughs> um, she... Um, Actually, she was not just beautiful. She was also bored with acting because usually um, working for a studio, you made like two movies a year, which took a couple of weeks, and the rest of the time, well, there was no Netflix. So <laughs> she didn't like to party that much. Um, she read, she painted, and she, also, she always invented little gadgets at home. Um, and um, she also worried, of course, at that time. She worried about the war going on in Europe. She, had, she was an emigrant, after all. She had friends and family still in Europe. And, um, oh yeah, it's just a couple of, that's Clark Gable, Jimmy Stewart. And then she was Delilah in Samson and Delilah, Technicolor. Yeah, anyway, she worried. And um, yeah, that's a fun tweet I found. Um, the feeling when you're 3,000% done with glam photo shoots and are inwardly planning a new radio frequency system for torpedoes. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. So that's what she started doing because she remembered um, what she had picked up. She knew about. German bombs being controlled by radio. She knew that Germany was using 18 different frequencies for their glide bombs and usually dis dispatching 18 bombs at a time. So um, the enemy would have to jam every single frequency and at least one would, you know, get, re get through. So especially in 1940, um, when Germany started uh, sinking English ships, in September 1940, 77 children who were um, being evacuated to Canada died. Uh, she offered 
her knowledge um, about weapons um, to the Navy, she thought about offering it because she had an idea. These German glide bombs, they were radio controlled. So um, why not make torpedoes with radio control to increase their chances of hitting targets and not just going in a straight line and maybe hitting something or not? Her second idea was um, to use just really, really short signals, just split seconds radio signals between the ship, the torpedo, and a plane overhead um, in between longer intervals of radio silence. And then her idea was changing the frequency of the split-second signal, making it harder to intercept and jam. Like Jack, she, she just said, okay, let's just use a lot of frequencies and hop. She called it frequency hopping. But of course, the question is how to do that. And here's where that second name mentioned in the patent comes in. This is George Antile. He was from New Jersey. In the 1920s, he moved to Berlin and then to Paris and became famous as an avant-garde composer and pianist. Here's another one. His most famous composition was the Ballet Mécanique in 1924, where he tried to synchronize 16 player pianos, and he also used airplane propellers and sirens. Um, you can also watch it on the internet, listen to it, it's crazy. It was the score for a movie, actually. Um, so he knew about synchronizing mechanical instruments when um, he met Hedy in 1940 at one of those Hollywood parties. And they started working together on their secret communication system, which they proposed to the National Inventors Council in 1941. Oh, here he is. There's, um, the tall one is Hedy, and uh, on the right is um, George, and the woman in the striped dress is George's wife. So their um, secret communication system suggested using 88 frequencies because there are 88 keys on a piano, it was just a little in-joke, um, and hopping between them, synchronizing um, the sender, the transmitter, and the receiver. And um, in addition, using random signals on three extra frequencies to just make some noise. So um, you have 88 frequencies, and you're hopping on some with the signal, you're sending one signal there, one signal here, and then you're sending random signals that don't mean anything. And um, if the enemy actually manages to intercept one of these frequencies, there would be like just one blip. And uh, it wouldn't make any sense. Um, what I want to just quickly talk about is this. So this is what they thought might happen. Here's an American ship going there, dispatching a torpedo that would usually go here. Here's a German ship, and it doesn't go in a straight line because it's trying to evade the torpedo. Here's a plane, and the plane is watching and messaging the ship that the torpedo needs to change its course and the ship is messaging the torpedo, go left, go right, go left, go right, go left, and then boom. Um, for synchronization between the sender and the receiver, they suggested using these paper ribbons with punch holes, just like in those mechanical pianos that uh, Antile um, used to be familiar with. Oh, here's actually um, a notebook that they used um, for the mechanism that was supposed to uh, make the sender and the receiver go off at the same time so they would be synchronized. The New York Times picked it up, and um, like they said, the National Inventors Council um, actually was positive, liked the idea, and uh, 
suggested that uh, they should patent this. The U.S. Patents Office awarded them the patent, but um, the Navy rejected it eventually. The Navy said it's too bulky, it's um, too big, we can't make this. But the question is why. The Navy actually thought, because they had said they wanted to use these paper ribbons, just like in a piano, and they were like, we can't put a piano in a torpedo, are you crazy? It's not going to work. Um, in fact, it would have been much smaller, of course. And then there was the issue of a Hollywood star known for her beautiful face and a crazy composer in, in, in inventing a weapon system. I don't think so. Um, then again, the timing was kind of bad. Right after Pearl Harbor, the Navy was in shock and busy fixing their existing torpedo system because in 1942, about 60% of American torpedoes were duds. They exploded too soon, they didn't explode at all, they went anywhere, and uh, so the Navy was like, okay, we got to fix this and we can't really develop anything new right now. And then one point that I've been thinking about is Haiti at that point was still technically an enemy alien. She wasn't uh, naturalized until 1953. So there's obviously always the question of loyalty, I think. Um, instead, she was, um, it was suggested that she should uh, help the war by selling war bonds, which she did very successfully. She sold seven million of uh, seven million dollars of war bonds in one day, which is in today's money about 100 million dollars. She also served cake at the famous Hollywood canteen. But her patent um, seemed to have been forgotten. It ran out in 1959. She never got anything from it. She never got any uh, financial gain, nothing. But in fact, there was secret military research on this topic from the 1940s until the 1970s. It was classified. Um, the first time uh, spread spectrum technology was used by the military was in 1962 during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, a system called Blades was installed in uh, ships in the Caribbean and late, later also in the Mediterranean Sea. And this system, um, using frequency hopping spread spectrum, was the only one that could not be jammed at that point. Um, civil use of this technology came much, much later. In the 1970s, 1980s, when the FCC um, started with the deregulation of uh, frequencies and allowed civil use um, of various frequencies in, let's say, microwaves, later mobile phones, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, etc., etc. Um, it actually started being used um, in the civil sector. In the early 1990s, uh, Dave Hughes, who's known as an internet pioneer, uh, came across Haiti, researched her patent, and lobbied for her recognition for the first time. Mm. He um, got her nominated for the Ele Electronic Frontier Foundation's Pioneer Award, which she was awarded in 1979 and uh, 1997. Um, she was 82 years old. She didn't leave the house anymore. Her son um, uh, went there and. Uh, got that award on her behalf, and supposedly she was very happy about it, that she finally got some recognition. In the past 10 years, especially in Austria, there has been at last more recognition of Haiti. There was an exhibition around the country. Um, the Austrian Republic awards the Haiti Lamar Award for Achievements by Women in Information Technology. And um, Vienna named a street after Haiti. Her birthday is now Inventor's Day. In the United States, she was finally uh, inducted in the National Inventors Hall of Fame two years ago. Well, 
I've been trying to speak just 20 minutes, giving you an overview of this, I think, remarkable person who um, should get much more recognition than she did. I think I've been a bit faster, actually. <laughs> That's good. Um, I'm hoping that maybe I've been able to inspire some interest in this person and maybe inspire someone to uh, read up on her or maybe uh, watch her movies. Sadly, she's been all but forgotten. Her career was, was, was big and very short. And then she lived on for decades. She was forgotten. Um, her inventions were forgotten. So I'm hoping that maybe you'd like to look at some sources, watch some movies. You could um, contact me. I have some, some really good books that I read on her that I would recommend. And that would be good. That would, uh, that would make me very happy because Doing research on Haiti um, was fun. It kind of you kind of develop a relationship to a person like that, and I like her. She was she was considered difficult as a woman, as an actor, but I think she was considered difficult for doing things that any man would have been considered, yeah, he's a strong guy and he knows what he wants and he does what he wants. She was always doing things her own way. She came to America on her own, alone. She made her way. She was, she was basically, um, you could say she was a refugee. I mean, she came with a contract, but she couldn't go back. Austria was gone. There was war. She always missed it. And she had to make her own way. She had to fight for a place in life. And she always tried to find happiness. Unfortunately, she didn't really find it. And so, in closing, before we can have a couple minutes for questions, I hope, um, I'd like to ask you to give a hand to Edie. Thanks a lot, Anja, for this uh, very nice talk. Uh, we have a couple of minutes for uh, questions and answers. So if you have something that you would like to know, please feel free to go to the mics. There's something going on online, I think. OK. Um, yes, thank you. I uh, you would like to know, um, are there any com Compatible stories where a non technic um, techni technium people or person contributed to technology? Um, I'm not, I'm not is, sure. Is there another that. Haiti? Oh, another Haiti. I'm pretty sure there is. I can't come up with any example right now, but maybe someone does. Um, because there are so many people, especially women, who are being overlooked for what they're doing. Um, like she was. I'm, I'm sorry, I can't really come up with any examples right now, but especially when it comes to women, um, it's still, sadly, it's still so hard for women to be recognized in a technological field like a man would. There's always, maybe especially when you're this pretty, Nobody thinks that there's anything behind this pretty face, and um, I don't know. I would, I would, I would like if anyone has an example, that would be great. I'm sure there's a lot of people who are another Hedi. I think the uh, person on microphone too was nodding to that, but you have a question okay. there, right? Yeah, um, that actually kind of covered my question, but. Um I just first of all wanted to thank you so much for doing this talk um, and also maybe uh, to sort of respond to you I think one of the things we could think about is not only women but also people particularly in the, what we still call the global south who are doing yes. amazing um, work that doesn't get recognized and you know um, we come to conferences and there's oftentimes a lot of community not a lot of communication between mm -hmm. developers in those places um, so I think it's very likely that's where our next Hedy Lamar could come from. Probably. Um, 
So that being said, I do have a question for you, mm -hmm. which is um, what can everybody here do to try to help avoid this? Like, how can we think outside the box and be reaching out to people and maybe uncovering hidden work and sort of breaking uh, breaking the mold? Because that's what happened to her. Like, she got mm. stuck in this structure mm -hmm. that existed. Mm -hmm. um, by thinking out outside the box, I think, by uh, supporting not just girls, from an early age, you know, to just not look at this gender uh, stereotypes, you know, you have a girl and uh, so, yeah, she can't be interested in technology. You should just be open and um, be open to anyone who's, you know, asking questions, who wants to learn and support that. It's really awesome to see so many little girls here too. Yes. So thanks to all the parents who are doing that. We have one more question online. Yes, thank you. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on her formal education? Was there anything else than normal school? Um, yes. Uh, well, you know, she was born in 1914. She went, uh, typically a girl of her status. She was from a well-off family. Her dad was a banker. Um, went to like a girls' school, which she did. Um, but uh, as far as I've I've read up, um, her dad actually supported uh, her learning. He he taught her a lot. He took her he he took her hiking. He told her um, how technical uh, apparatuses work, and he always he supported her learning a lot. But then again, she had the typical formal education of a girl of her age and status. And when she was 16, she was at a, at a, um, at a finishing school in Switzerland, Switzerland, and she ran away because she wanted to be an actress. So I guess it was not that challenging. It was nothing that really interested her in that school. I'm guessing girls, they learned how to be a good wife, how to, you know, know enough so that you're not too boring for your future husband. That was the goal of educating girls. We got another question on mic one. Hi, uh, I would like to thank you for this talk as well and for the uh, intervention just uh, on uh, microphone number two. I would uh, want to know, I would like to know what led you to researching Hedy's life and how did you stumble upon this personality? Because as you said yourself, it's hard to, I mean, if they're not recognized, how, how do you mm -hmm. find her at all? Um, Thank you. So how did I find her? I found her last year. I had never, ever heard of her, never seen any of her movies. Somebody on Twitter who I follow uh, posted a link about her, like a, a an article online about her inventions. And I read that and I thought, wow, that's interesting. Who is that? And then I, I just started um, Googling her. And uh, in the end, I started buying all these books and, and reading and watching her movies. And I'm really happy about that because, as I said, I really like her. So yeah, Twitter. <laughs> I think, ah, there's someone at mic six. Yeah, I wasn't sure because you sat down again. So please ask your question ah. now. Um, I'm not sure you said like, or the name of the talk was the woman behind Wi-Fi. Can you explain the title and her position and what mm -hmm. was made out of her theory? Um, yeah, I chose that title because um, a lot of um, articles there are, there's a lot of short mentions of her online and they often stress that yeah she was one of the pioneers of these technologies that eventually led to today's wi-fi and bluetooth um and there's still always this discussion um when somebody says well yeah she invented wi-fi which i wouldn't say because she didn't but um she was one of many pioneers working uh, on this technology the past decades. 
And there's still always kind of a misogynistic backlash when when somebody uh, recognizes her achievement, then people are always, yeah, well, um, it's so different, Wi-Fi and, and spread spectrum today from what she did, and she didn't really, well, she didn't really do anything, it's not that important. And that's um, still today, and I think it is important what she did. She was ahead of her time. She thought about something that scientists um, during that time could not grasp. It was possible, her patent was feasible. And um, it's, uh, to, to answer your question, it's kind of a little provocative, maybe, the title, intentionally, to just um, make you think about what exactly did she do? which is not that little, I think. I think uh, regardless of a provocative title, it was a really uh, amazing talk, and we would like to thank, thank you, you one more time. Okay.